A very good evening to you. Welcome to the KATV studios and tonight's debate featuring two of the candidates vying to become Arkansas's 47th governor. I'm Chris May from KATV. I'll be moderating tonight's debate. I'm joined by the nominee of the Arkansas Democratic Party, Dr. Chris Jones, and the nominee of the Libertarian Party of Arkansas, Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. The Republican nominee, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, declined our invitation to appear on this or any other night, but that invitation stands throughout this debate. The rules are straightforward and have been agreed to by the campaigns. I'll pose a question to one candidate who will have two minutes to answer, followed by a one minute rebuttal. They've agreed not to interrupt each other. And at the end of our question and answer period, Period, each candidate will have one minute to make a closing statement. We've just flipped a coin to decide who would be given the first question, and that goes to Mr. Harrington. Gentlemen, first, thank you so much uh, for you. being here thank with you. us. Good, to, Good to have you. Mr. Harrington, to have a successful students in our state, we need to have successful teachers as well. Promises of pay raises for teachers in Arkansas were put off until the next regular session of the legislature when the 47th governor will be in office. If you are that person, what will you ask of lawmakers when it comes to teacher pay? Well, I have come out in favor of teacher pay. I know our teachers are doing an incredible work for the people of this state and especially our children. And I understand uh, some of the frustrations whenever you pour your heart into something and it seems like nobody recognizes the work that you're doing. And I know our teachers have a passion for raising our children up educationally wise and uh, helping to build up that, that new future that's coming up. Uh, I've, I've talked about this frequently about the issue of teacher pay and it being such a lionized political issue uh, when it comes to other uh, state employees pay, there's no big champion for that. And I don't want anyone to understand that I'm not in favor of teacher pay, but if it's, a, if it's the magic bullet that's going to make things right, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stand in the way, but we've got to make some strides in getting Arkansas beyond the current station that it is in it right now. You know, at one point in time we didn't have public schools and now we have public schools Maybe there is something, something new around the corner that we can look forward to, something to innovate, uh, because each, each child does not learn the same way, and we have to start figuring out ways to reach our children and set them up for success. Dr. Jones, what would you promise to teachers if you were the 47th governor of Arkansas? Yeah, and no, I appreciate that question. And you know, you can go to my website at ChristopherGovernor.com and see our plan for uh, teacher pay. It's actually a teacher pay plus plan, because you know, teachers are essential and critical. Uh, to our society because education is essential and critical to our society. And my grandfather had a third grade education, but he pushed education hard because he knew that it was the door that opened up so many opportunities. Uh, so when I think about how we set in Arkansas where every family and every child can thrive, again, it starts with education. Uh, and a big part of that is making sure that we're not losing teachers, making sure that we're supporting teachers, and making sure that we're paying them adequately. So if you look at our plan, uh, it actually follows Governor H. H. Asa Hutchinson's plan. That's very sustainable and it increases teachers' minimum pay up to $46,000. Now, teacher pay is a part of the overall comprehensive system. We have to have an educational system that serves every Arkansan uh, in a way that really opens up the doors of opportunity. But again, it starts with teacher pay. In uh, June of this year, the Supreme Court overturned uh, Roe versus Wade and triggered a law here in Arkansas uh, banning abortion with one exception, and that is to save the life of the mother. What changes to that law, if any, would you support as governor? Dr. Jones. Yeah, you know, when I think about the Dobbs decision and I think about my opponent who is not here and the extremist nature of no exceptions at all, um, I, I, my, my heart goes out to not only families, but also think about my 13-year-old daughter uh, and my wife, who is amazing. And certainly, if it comes down to a decision of her life, um, I would want that decision to be between a woman, her family, and her God. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the case uh, with our trigger law. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to see a Sarah Huckabee Sanders showing up at the door with two Arkansas State Police uh, trying to determine what happened with uh, a miscarriage. Instead, I want our police out uh, really dealing with crimes that are, that are plaguing our communities right now. Uh, so it, it's unfortunate what happened. 
Uh, I certainly am a supporter of, I was a supporter of Roe v. Wade, uh, and I think we have to leave these decisions to, to women, uh, their families, and their God. Uh, uh, Mr. Harrington, you have said that you can make a libertarian argument both for abortion rights and, and against them. Where do you stand on this? Well, I personally, um, I feel grief while we, we talk about this, this issue. I honestly believe that it's definitely between the parties involved, a woman, her family, her physician, and it's none of the government's business. Um, those nights whenever the baby's crying, who's going to be there, that mother or that father? But I'd like to say something to both the pro-choice and the pro-life communities right now. Young men and women, if you're not ready to be a mother or father, do not do those things that make you one. Take every single precaution or prophylactic that you can take in order to, to minimize unwanted pregnancies. Take personal responsibility. For the pro-life group, and especially if it's on religious beliefs, why don't you address that issue under the parameters of your faith, to show gentleness, to show love? How much does it mean to you? Start offering people money to carry a baby to term and try to find a home for that child as well. If you're going to be pro-life, be pro-life entirely. Uh, to be clear, uh, as a legislative solution, would you want to add exceptions for rape or incest into this law? Would you set a limit for abortion in the state? The state of Georgia, for instance, limits it up to six weeks. Other places are 20 weeks, 24 weeks. What would you want to do legislatively? Look, Dobbs uh, traded religious freedom for government mandated pregnancies. And I would certainly push for exceptions for rape and incest. Um, and again, my opponent who's not here uh, is not pushing for that. So, you know, when I think about, again, my 13-year-old daughter, uh, I, I don't want that decision to be in the hands of a legislator, in the hands of someone who has no idea what my family's going through and what our family's going through. Uh, I believe in this notion of freedom. And when, if you really want to have freedom, you have to appreciate uh, what it means, particularly from a legislative standpoint. Uh, so certainly I would push for those uh, exceptions. Okay, and additional exceptions from you as well, Mr. Harrington? Definitely, I, I would say I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Jones on, on, on this issue here. Um, getting a little late term in the abortion, you know, some people might have serious moral issues with that, but definitely, um, you know, when it comes to the life of the mother, we definitely need to make exceptions for that, rape, incest, those things. Um, it's just a terrible, terrible situation for young women and women to go through whenever they've been subjected to that. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, if, if I can, and let, me, let me be clear, you know, some will try to uh, uh, paint this as uh, an extreme when you talk about including exceptions. Roe provided reasonable uh, restrictions. Uh, and certainly I agree uh, with Mr. Harrington here in terms of we do need reasonable restrictions in place uh, and we need to make sure that, that decision is in the hands of the woman, her family, and her God. Okay. Crime prevention uh, is an issue that is most directly handled, of course, on the local level. But as chief executive of the state, when you see data that shows violent crime consistently on the rise in Arkansas, uh, th that would certainly have to trouble you. How would you make our city safer as governor, Mr. Harrington? Well, I've worked in the prison systems here in Arkansas, and I want to get this point across. Um, my whole philosophy on our justice system is that we do not need to punish innocent people. We need to punish those who have deprived individuals of life, limb, and property. And some of these knuckleheads that are in our state, we need to go after them, and we need to give our law enforcement a little more freedom to not go after some of these victimless crimes like cannabis possession and things like that. We need to focus more, let that be a mental health issue. Because if we treat it as a criminal justice issue, we compound the issue that those people are already facing. It needs to be strictly mental health. Now what I plan to do, I want to work with the state police and we've got to get these gangs busted up in our state. No tolerance. Okay. Dr. Jones, making Arkansas safer, how do you do it as governor? Yeah, you know, community safety is certainly uh, something that every family thinks about and deals with. And we want safe communities. Um, it, it, what we haven't done is really focus on the root cause of the issue. You know, Mr. Harrington mentioned some issues around mental health, drug addiction, 
economic opportunities. So when, first of all, we have to think about how do we address the root cause? Uh, and part of the way we do it is I believe we spread PB&J. You know, I, I talk about PB&J and it sounds cutesy, but it's real. It's preschool broadband and jobs because we know that kids that go to pre-K are less likely to go to prison. And we know that when you have a job, if you come out of the prison system and have a job, you're less likely to go back in. You know, so part of what we have to do is really focus on those root cause issues, in addition to issues like mental health, uh, drug addiction, and the like. And as, in doing so, we provide safer communities. Now, specifically for the, the challenges we face now, one of the things that we haven't done is actually set and had an inclusive table where we brought folks and sit them down and say, look, you know, the police, the families that are impacted, the people that are causing the chaos, uh, the, the business community, and really t uh, unpack and understand why it is that we're seeing an increase in crime and make sure we put the right resources uh, towards addressing those issues. And there are solutions across the state. I've traveled to all 75 counties. And as I've gone across the state, I've heard solutions that work, but they need an opportunity to be lifted up and spread across the state as well. Uh, we have seen in Arkansas a series of incidents that, that have caused mistrust mm -hmm. between law enforcement uh, and the community, and especially communities of color. Um, the shootings of Bradley Blackshire and Jaden Prunty and Hunter Britton and Drew Kemp, uh, the in custody death of Terrence Caffey, the videotaped beating of a man in mm. Crawford County. I if you are governor, what would you do to try and, and head off and prevent tragedies like these that do so much damage in so many ways? Yeah, they, they do a lot of damage. And, and uh, seeing, hearing about, witnessing um, those situations is heart wrenching because that, those are always involve someone's family member, someone's brother, someone's mother, someone's sister, cousin, you name it. Uh, and so it, it tears my heart apart that these things happen. You know? And yet, there are police officers who are doing it right. You know? And I'm a strong supporter of law enforcement. Uh, and I believe we need, in order to have a functioning society, we need it to be, lay on a foundation of law enforcement and law and order. Uh, and there are examples that work. So yeah, I, I think about North Little Rock and Officer Norman. And Officer Norman is loved by everyone. Uh, and he knows how to get into the community, build those relationships, and through those relationships, he's able to lock up the folks who are knuckleheads, um, but also prevent people from going down a pathway of knuckleheadness. Uh, and part of the way you do that is by taking his example, lifting it up, and making sure that every police uh, district across the state has the training they need, have the resources they need, uh, in order to really do that job in the community. And I'll tell you, one thing that you can't do uh, is provide those resources if you cut our income tax down to zero and remove that revenue stream from, uh, from the budget, because you're going to have to cut somewhere. Uh, and what I would want to do is make sure we're investing in communities, and, also, and that includes investing in law enforcement. Okay. I think you may have just coined a phrase there. I'm not sure. Oh, that did I? Knuckle, knuckle <laughs> no, is, is in the dictionary. Uh, it, it will be after the date. <laughs> uh, Mr. Harrington, uh, cutting down on, on police brutality and making sure people in our communities are safe, how do you do it? Absolutely. We have got to set a culture of zero tolerance for dirty staff. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to do it. Uh, working in the ADC, we were taught not to have any tolerance for dirty staff because they put people's life at risk. They put inmates' life, they put staff's life at risk whenever they try to bring in contraband or be dirty. You understand? Mm -hmm. We have to just set up a culture within our law enforcement and our law enforcement officers, if they see another law enforcement officer doing something dirty, I understand that you want to have somebody looking after your back when you're out there on the street, but we cannot have it. If we want to be in this country where everyone is innocent until proven guilty, where we have freedom from oppression, it all starts in our police departments with zero tolerance for that type of behavior. We, we have to start doing it. And so if I'm elected governor, I will be trying to foster a, a culture of integrity. We're going to administer justice. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to cut out all of the nonsense. Because if we are supposed to be enforcing the law, we've got to walk that fine line ourselves with integrity. OK, very good. It, it, One more comment? Yeah, just it's an issue of fairness. Sure. You know, and, um, and Mr. Harrington is exactly right in that, in the sense of how are we treating all of our citizens. And no one should get a leg up just because they have a title. 
um, and, and, and the fair administration of justice uh, is what has to be the central ideal. Okay. Uh, next year will mark 10 years of Medicaid expansion in Arkansas. A uh, couple different programs through the private option. First, Arkansas Works, now Our Home. Uh, are you satisfied, Mr. Harrington, with Medicaid expansion in Arkansas? And are those programs improving health in our state as well as just providing coverage? I, I know there's a libertarian philosophy on this, but I'm going to be governor, hopefully, I'm running to be governor for all the people of Arkansas, so it's just not about my way. It's about something that's going to benefit everyone. And for the expansion of Medicaid, the focus for me would be on expanding our residency program. We need more physicians practicing medicine and hopefully bringing down that cost by having more people practicing in that field here in the state. And so I'll be looking for avenues and ways to increase those residency slots so we can have more physicians practicing. Okay, Dr. Jones. Yeah, so I've, I had the opportunity to meet with all of the, uh, the state agency heads, so all the 15 agencies and, uh, and some, of the, some outside of the 15. Uh, and a big part of the discussion, particularly when, um, when in, in speaking with the Department of Health, uh, is around uh, expansion of Medicaid and around how do we make sure that we have adequate health care across the state. Because at the end of the day, you know, again, I've traveled to all 75 counties, uh, and what our Kansans want is access to quality health care. You know, my mother had a stroke, uh, and I witnessed it here in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. I saw her face droop and her speech slur. Uh, and she was fortunate that we were able to get to the hospital in five minutes. Had she been in her hometown of Stevens or my dad's hometown of, Steve, of Hughes, I'm not sure she would have made it. And so the real question is, how do we ensure that wherever you are and whoever you are across Arkansas, you have access to adequate health care? Uh, that, that, to me, should be the focus and the push. And so how do you do that? Well, I think part of the way you do that is uh, you ensure that, that we're resourcing hospitals appropriately. You know, we're, we're at risk of losing um, many rural hospitals because they're losing tens of, to hundreds of millions of dollars a year. You know, one of the, one of the tangible ways to do that is we need to renegotiate the reimbursement rate. You know, we haven't gone back to Congress and said, gone back to the, uh, the federal administration and say, hey, look, well, let's renegotiate the rates so that what the hospitals are able to reimburse and get back, it actually is adequate to sustain them. Uh, and we certainly need to provide incentives for our physicians to be in rural areas, areas that they otherwise would not practice in. Okay. Mr. Harrington? I'd also like to add, uh, you know, something that's a part of my platform, which is repealing the certificate of need laws which is essentially going to your competition and asking them for permission to be able to open up a hospital. Um, in some of our rural areas, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity. We, we kind of need to change our thinking that there is no opportunity in rural areas. There is, there's plenty of opportunity. And opening some of these uh, the hospitals in these underserved areas by removing that law. We want to focus on laws that are roadblocks from progress and we're getting some of those laws off the books that are keeping people that have the heart and the mind to go provide those services for people. Uh, Health care for transgender young people in Arkansas emerged as an issue last year with uh, a law that prevented doctors from performing surgeries or even offering uh, certain therapies for trans boys or girls under the age of, of 18. That law is now hung up in the court, but w what is your position uh, on this issue, health care for trans minors. So th this is the exactly the divisive sort of issue that, um, that folks want to lift up and use as a punching bag. Uh, and you know, I've, again, I've traveled to the state and we have uh, supporters like Jim in Louisville and supporters like Brandon who's uh, a trans youth. Uh, and what they talk about often are uh, making sure that they have adequate access to education, adequate access to health care, adequate access to, uh, to opportunities. So for me, I go back to a fundamental principle. It's a principle of fairness and a principle of love. Uh, and fairness says that whoever you are, you should get access to health care. Uh, and I would, you, I, I would operate from that principle uh, as governor. And I certainly think that regardless of who you are, you should have access to adequate health care. Okay. Mr. Harrington, would you look to repeal the trans health care law? I would not. I would not. Uh... And if I'm understanding this correctly, I believe that people have the right to self-determination. Um, it's their life. And if they feel a certain way, they have the 
right to pursue that life for themselves. And I, I just disagree with some of the laws that are being passed that restrict the freedom of free people. We live in this free country, right, where liberty, freedom, and justice reigns. Uh, getting too involved in people's personal lives and personal decisions, I don't think that's the peer view of the government. And we should be providing opportunities for people to express themselves when they're not harming anyone else. If it's a personal decision and no one else is being harmed, people should be free to, to pursue that oh. avenue. So just to be clear, you, you would oppose the law that prevents doctors from providing these treatments for transgender children yeah, if they yes. wish to transition? Yes, Okay, sir. great. It's, you mentioned marijuana earlier. We yeah. both, uh, you both uh, support legalizing marijuana for adult consumption in Arkansas, which voters will have the opportunity to do when they go to the polls, when they vote on issue four. Sarah Sanders uh, said just yesterday that she will vote against uh, issue four. Why do you think it's uh, the right thing to do? And I believe you're up, Dr. Jones. Am, am I? Okay. Uh, look, there, there, there's sort of two issues on the table when you talk about uh, this ballot initiative. Uh, and, and everyone in Arkansas has a right to vote however they want to vote. And that's the beauty of democracy, uh, in being able to do that. But one issue is citizens' ability to put an issue on the ballot, uh, an initiative on the ballot. And I certainly support that because we want the voice of our Kansans to be heard. Um, and I'm a big proponent of the voice of our Kansans being heard, all our Kansans. Uh, the other is a matter of a just and equitable cannabis industry. You know, we certainly need to move towards a just and equitable cannabis industry. You can't talk about freedom uh, and then say that you're going to dictate and determine uh, what someone does. Uh, that, that, those ideals are contradictory. Uh, so for me, it's a matter of providing an opportunity for our Kansans to have a voice uh, and moving towards a just and equitable cannabis industry. Uh, and in fact, the, the external benefits are you know, the revenue that we receive are able to go to things like education, like mental health, uh, addressing mental health issues, addressing uh, drug addiction issues. These are things that actually can be bolstered by the revenue that comes from, uh, from the passage of this bill. Mr. Perry, this has been a cause for libertarian politicians for years and years. <laughs> Finally, the opportunity is on the table. How do you feel about this? Yes, sir. I've, I've been campaigning for um, marijuana reform for a number of years. This is something that's part of who I am even when I was a Democrat. Um, but we should not be locking people up for using cannabis. It's just not justice. And especially right now, whenever there's so much money being generated for the state, we should be uh, releasing people from prison, jails, for minor possession, nonviolent possession charges. Uh, we just need to do it. It's just justice. And the expungement is not a part no, of it issue is not four, a part. but you, you would work for that as governor? Yes, sir, I would work for it. I, I did favor True Grass Amendment over uh, the current one that is going to be voted on. And I'd like to add one, uh, one more thing to that. In the 2020 election cycle, every single citizen-led initiative was knocked off the ballot. Every initiative led by the legislature was on the ballot. And we keep, we having a pattern here. Uh, especially with one of the issues for a supermajority for the citizens, but the supermajority is not needed for the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is another pattern, and I want people to see this. It is a pattern about for, by those in power who seek to minimize the people's interest in our participation in the government. Uh, here recently, there was a court case which I was involved in uh, for third parties to be able to get on the ballot. It was declared unconstitutional. We're fighting for these things here. We're fighting for the rights of all people in the state. Okay. Very quickly, would you seek to release people from, from incarcer who are incarcerated for minor marijuana offenses? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, I, and I think we're move, we should move towards that. Um, you know, again, I, 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 it's important that we all have the ability to vote however we want to. Uh, and one of the things that the initiative being on the ballot does is it signals that citizens can have their voice heard. Uh, and that's what we have to push towards. Simultaneously, we really do need to push towards a just and equitable cannabis industry that does address and redress some of these concerns. You know, you can't talk about overpopulation of prisons uh, while also ignoring that some of these minor offenses are really taking up space. Okay, let me try to get one more question yeah. in before our final <laughs> statements. Time is short. Um, in August, the governor and the legislature uh, lowered the individual income tax rate to 4.9%, the business tax rate, the corporate tax rate to 5.3%. Would you have signed those bills into law as governor, and would either of you look to raise taxes as governor to pay for items on your agenda? Yeah, is that me? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, I believe it is you, Mr. Harrington. I, I would sign those tax uh, decreases. Okay. We, we've got to find a way to get away from this tax and spend type of behavior that is prevalent in our government. Just continue to tax more and continue to spend more. It's not going to be sustainable. But there, there are programs that are necessary, those safety net programs. There are things that the government does provide that's necessary for us to continue to live in this civilized society. But we've, we've got to find a way what's necessary versus what's frivolous. And I would go in uh, to that office looking at what's necessary and what's frivolous, but also I want to get input from the people. It's just not going to be edicts. The people need to be involved in this. Uh, you know, my campaign model is the, the people rule. And the same with our state's model here is the people rule. And we've got to get back down to that good governance, mm -hmm. to where the people are involved, the people have a say, and that the majority just, not, just doesn't just run over the minority. They take into account their concerns as well. Okay, tax rates, how do you feel about them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am for tax cuts. Uh, I, I certainly see no need to increase taxes. Understanding that I'm more for fiscally responsible government. You know, how are we ensuring that we're using every dollar that citizens are entrusting us with uh, to meet the needs and address the issues and really invest in a foundation that provides opportunity for everyone? You know, so when I, when I look at our budget and I think about the surplus uh, and I think about my opponent who decided not to show uh, in talking about eliminating 55% of the state revenue, you know, to me, what comes to mind is what bills are we not paying? You know, I think about Diamond City. Diamond City in North, Ar North Arkansas uh, has a water and sewer system that's going to fail in the next three to five years. And when it fails, it's going to run off into the Arkansas River. That's going to impact all of us. I think about Jim in Louisville. And he's, he, all, the only thing he wants is that his roads to be fixed. You know, these are, these are unpaid bills uh, that, were, that at some point the bill is going to come due. Uh, and so certainly I would support... Uh, I would support appropriate tax cuts that benefit as many Arkans Arkansans as possible. Okay, closing statement time. Let's get to a quick closing statement from you. Dr. Jones, you're up first. Yeah. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to speak to Arkansans, uh, I'm, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to show up. As a seventh generation Arkansan, uh, I've been here, uh, ra born and raised here, grew up riding dirt bikes, eating, eating honeysuckle, and fighting grasshoppers. Uh, and it was a great foundation that provided me the opportunity to go on and get five degrees and work at NASA, that wouldn't have happened if I had not been given those opportunities. I see in Arkansas where everyone can work together at the table and really lift us all up and provide opportunity for all Arkansans. No matter what your last name is, no matter how many zeros you have in your bank account, no matter what you look like or where you live, that's the Arkansas that we need, that's the Arkansas that we can have, and it starts with spreading PB&J across the state, and then it builds on us being ready for a 21st century economy. Okay, Mr. Harrington, your closing statement. If there is one thing the people of Arkansas can take from my campaign, it's this, is that we need to get back down to the basics of liberty and freedom in this country. I've traveled the world, I've been to a lot of different countries, I've been to a socialistic country, I've been a missionary in a communist country, and of course live here in America where we have a mixed economy. I've met people that are in their 80s and 90s and have never voted in their life, not because they choose not to, but because they cannot. And I see this authoritarianism rising in our country. And every last one of us, it doesn't matter what party you are with, we need to stand against authoritarianism. Because liberty and authoritarianism cannot coexist in a free society. Right. That is our time for tonight. Our thanks to uh, Dr. Chris Jones and Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. for joining us and to you for watching. Don't forget early voting in Arkansas begins October 24th. Election Day is November 8th. We encourage you to make your voice heard. I'm Chris May. Good night.